All right, we are in Isaiah. This Christmas season, we have been looking at the gospel through the lens of Isaiah and just looking at what Isaiah teaches us about not just the first coming of Jesus, but also the second coming of Jesus. And we continue our Advent study in the book of Isaiah and seeing how this prophetic book of the Old Testament is full of hope and full of promise, not just regarding the promise of a coming Messiah, but the promise of a second coming when Jesus will come to make all things right once and for all. Oftentimes as we prepare for Christmas, we spend a lot of time thinking about superficial things, important things, but not the ultimate, things like trees or presents or parties or holidays or family or travel. But the best possible way as followers of Jesus that we can prepare is not only by looking back to Jesus' birth, but also looking forward in confidence that Jesus is coming back again. And that's what actually Advent, which simply means arrival, is all about. It's about celebrating the first coming of Jesus in light of the fact that he is soon going to come again. One of the songs that we would sing growing up in church was by Andre Crouch, and the words were simple. He would say something like, Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. You guys know this? Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We're going to see the king. Next stanza said, no more crying there. We are going to see the king. No more crying there. We are going to see the king. No more crying there. We are going to see the king. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We're going to see the king. One more stanza. No more dying there, we are going to see the King. No more dying there, we are going to see the King. No more dying there, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King. I don't know about you, but the older I get, And the more I see the chaos in the world and the devastation of sin, the more that song becomes not just a fun song to sing. It's a lot of fun when the drums are playing and the music is going, but it becomes an earnest prayer. Jesus, show up. Jesus, come. We want you to come and come quickly. So far in our series, we saw in Isaiah 40 a few weeks ago that there was a comfort to be found when we throw off distractions that are around us and we cry out in dependence on Jesus and we make straight paths by proclaiming to the world around us that Jesus is coming. A few weeks ago, we saw from Isaiah 55 that all of us have been invited, me personally and us, y'all, have been invited to this meal, this incredible banquet. And this isn't an ordinary meal, but one that offers true satisfaction, one where we are full and satisfied, that is only available through a relationship with Jesus, but demands a response now. And last week, our brother Saw, who's sitting on the sidelines injured this morning, looked at Isaiah 60, where God Almighty invites us to imagine waking us, waking up in a holy city, a new city, a new Jerusalem, with God at the center of that city. This morning, we're going to be in Isaiah 63 and 64. And as you read through the book of Isaiah, which I pray you've been doing, each and every time it seems like that glorious future is within grasp. It's right there, and then all of a sudden it's snatched away. It's gone. And so we arrive at Isaiah 63. The enemies have already been overthrown. It seems like the long-anticipated and promised future has arrived, and yet it's still out of reach. It's still not there. And so in the most surprising of ways, as the people of God still wait 
for their ultimate rescue. These final chapters of Isaiah are all about a praying church and the promises of God coming together. Amidst their anguish, amidst their pain, amidst their waiting, they turn away from their complaining voices and they begin to look at the promise-keeping God that has been good to them over and over. In Isaiah 62, the chapter before, as the people awaited the arrival of the Anointed One, the Lord said, post watchmen, post intercessors around the city. The image were, imagery was that these people, these men and women were supposed to be watching the city, but they were supposed to be praying day and night at the gate of the new city, which they were awaiting, even though from a distance, crying out to God, reminding God of his promises. And they weren't reminding God of his promises because God somehow all of a sudden had amnesia. That he somehow forgot the promises that he made. But this was the task that God had set them to do. They were the ones who were to call upon God to constantly have the promises of God on their lips and their hearts. That's the image at the forefront of these closing chapters of Isaiah. And that's exactly the role that Isaiah sets in mind in chapter 63 and 64. It's a phenomenal prayer. They used it as they waited for deliverance. And I want to read it for you. Isaiah 63 verses 7 and all, of, all the way through the end of chapter 64. Isaiah 63 verse 7. It says, I will make known the Lord's faithful love and the Lord's praiseworthy acts because of all the Lord has done for us. Even the many good things he has done for the house of Israel which he did for them based on his compassion, the abundance of his faithful love. He said, they are indeed my people, children who will not be disloyal, and he became their savior. In all of their suffering, he suffered, and the angel of his presence saved them. He redeemed them because of his love and his compassion. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of the past, but they rebelled. And they grieved the Holy Spirit. And so he became their enemy. And he fought against them. And then he remembered the days of the past, the days of Moses and his people, where he, where is he who brought them out of the sea with shepherds of his flock? Where is he who put his Holy Spirit among the flock? He made his glorious strength available at the right hand of Moses, divided the waters before them, to make an eternal name for himself. And he led them through the depths like a horse in the wilderness so that they will not stumble. Like cattle that go down into a valley, the Spirit of the Lord gave them rest. You led your people this way to make a glorious name for yourself. And here's Isaiah's prayer. He says, look down from heaven and see from your lofty home, holy and beautiful. Where is your zeal and your might? Your yearning and your compassion are withheld from me. Yet you are our father. Even though Abraham does not know us and Israel does not recognize us, you, Lord, are our father. Your name is our redeemer, the ancient times. Why, Lord, do you make us stray from your ways? You harden our hearts so that we do not fear you. Return because of your servants, the tribes of your heritage. Your holy people had a possession for a little while. But our enemies have trampled down your sanctuary. We have become like those who never, you never ruled, like those who do not bear your name. If only you would tear the heavens open and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence. Just as fire kindles brushwood and fire boils water to make your name known to your enemies so that nations will tremble at your presence. When you did awesome works that we did not expect, you who came down and the mountains quaked at your presence. From ancient times, no one has heard, no one has listened to, no eye has seen any God except you who acts on behalf of the one who waits for him. You welcome the one who joyfully does what is right. They remember you in your ways, but we, we have sinned and you are angry. How can we be saved if we remain in our sins? All of us have become like something unclean, and our righteous acts are like a polluted garment. 
All of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities carry us away like the wind. No one calls on your name, striving to take a hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us, and you made us melt out of your iniquity, out of our iniquity. Yet, Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are the potter. We all are the work of your hands. Lord, do not be terribly angry or remember our iniquity forever. Please look, all of us are your people. Your holy cities have become a wilderness. Zion has become a wilderness. Jerusalem, a desolation. Our holy and beautiful temple where our fathers praised you has been burned down. All that is dear to us lies in ruins. Lord, after all of this, will you restrain yourself Will you keep silent and afflict us severely? This is a powerful prayer from Isaiah to God. This is a prayer that was used for generations afterward in some of the most challenging times in the nation of Israel's history as they awaited God's intervention and redemption. And just as Isaiah is calling the people of Israel to be a people of prayer, we too, on the cusp of Christmas, and just a little over a week from a brand new year, we're waiting. And we too are called to be a people of prayer. We're waiting between the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus. And at the heart of waiting for Jesus' return, we too are called to be a people of prayer. To watch. To pray. This is a prayer for people who are living in between times. If you feel distressed, if you feel the world crushing you in, or you feel like the kingdom isn't coming quickly enough, or God isn't answering your prayer fast enough, then this prayer is for you. It teaches you how to pray. As a people living in between times, there's three things this passage teaches us that our prayers would be shaped by. Three things that our prayers should be shaped by. Number one, genuine adoration. Our prayers should be shaped by genuine adoration. As you read through this passage, as you listen to this part of Isaiah, it's hard to miss the amazing ways in which Isaiah describes God. Isaiah knows to whom he prays to. Verse 7 talks about God's kindness, his compassion. Verse 9 talks about his love and his mercy. Verse 15 talks about his zeal and his might, his holiness, his glory, his tenderness. And yet this is it. Isaiah simply summing up some glowing characteristics of God without any basis. He's not just randomly thinking about random names for God. Isaiah can describe God in this way because God has a track record that can match it. Of God calling Israel into existence. They've been marked by grace from beginning to end. Of God's gracious and glorious deliverance out of Egypt of their relationship with God as that of a parent and a child, that God has known their distress and saved them when they were going through hard times. Isaiah is recalling to the people the consistency of God, the faithfulness of God, that it is God who had taken the initiative, that it is God who lifted them up, that it is God who is faithful over and over, that it is God who is trustworthy. The Lord has said not only has he been with them this whole time, but he is he himself who has carried them through this whole time. But Isaiah isn't simply recalling aspects of God that are convenient for his agenda. I don't know if you and I ever do that. Do we, we just remember characteristics of God based on what we need? For example, I mess up, I sin, all of a sudden, oh God, you are so merciful. Forgive me, Jesus. And then someone wrongs me and like, God, you are such a good judge. Punish them. Judge them. I'm not the only one, am I? Right? We remember which part of God we want when we need it. Isaiah doesn't do that. Isaiah doesn't present a lopsided view of God and his adoration. Isaiah recognizes God for who he really is. Not because... That's the right or the realistic thing to do, but because it is the basis of God's unchanging nature to which Isaiah will appeal. Friends, anything else would be a powerless illusion. And when we arrive at verse 10, we come to a rude shock. It's a continuing declaration 
of not only who God is, but who the people were, who we are. Verse 10 says they rebelled and they grieved the Holy Spirit. And God became their enemy and he fought against them. See, while the track record of God's faithfulness was consistent and faithful, the track record of his people back then and even now is that we are inconsistent. We're fickle. There are days where we're pursuing God, and then there's days we have our own agenda that we're pursuing. And as Isaiah recalls, while the people of God would rebel and cause God to turn from them, eventually they would remember God, and God would be gracious and restore them. And that's what Isaiah is recalling. And that's what he's causing to come to mind. See, the love that Isaiah speaks about, a steadfast love, is an amazing word in the Hebrew. It's not any type of love, but it's a love that's in reference to the undeserved covenant mercies of God. Not based on anything we have done or we deserve. It's undeserved. It's a love that's made permanent in the promise that God himself initiated. It's a love that prevails despite the stubborn resistance of you and I. It's a love that pervades even in defiant and intentional rebellion against God. It's a love that remains even when God oftentimes seems distant from us. And it's a love that you can know, and it's a love that you, it should fill your prayers as we look to Jesus and see it poured out on the cross. Lamentation says the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Apostle Paul would take a similar tone in Romans 8 when he says, Friends, what can separate us from the love of God? Nothing can separate us from the love of God for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. As the people of God awaited for the coming of the Messiah, they were waiting for a future promise. But friends, you and I, awaiting Jesus' return, we have even more reason than Isaiah and the people of Israel to have a prayer that's characterized by adoration and worship to Jesus because we know that the promises of God have been fulfilled when Jesus came. And he lived the life you and I couldn't live and died the death that you and I should have died so that you and I can be called sons and daughters of God. We know that the promises have come to fruition. Instead of being stuck and looking back or within, Isaiah bundles it up all together and he looks upward and he begins to worship God. Isaiah, in his genuine adoration for God, is saying, the basis of my prayer is not me, but the basis of my prayer is God, who you are and what you have done. When our prayer life centers on the goodness of God, it not only recognizes God for who he is, but it, does, it recognizes God for who he is instead of who we shape him to be. It reminds us of who God is and who we're, we're, that we're not God. And it pushes us deeper into dependence on God. Friends, as we look forward to a new year, as we look forward to winding down this year and all that the new year will bring, it would be absolutely wonderful if our prayers would be increasingly shaped by adoration of who God is, of who he is. That as we pray, that we would dwell deeper into who God is and pour out genuine adoration for who he is and what he's done. We can have a lot of New Year resolutions, but prayer filled with adoration is powerful. That instead of your prayers being dominated with a list of requests of all the things that God needs to do for you, that it would instead be filled with bountiful praise and worship for who he is and what he's already done for you. And when we do that, it will shape how and what we pray for. A simple way that you can do that is start thinking about God's saving acts through history or by reading through a gospel and writing down every characteristic of Jesus that you see. Isaiah's theological conviction shapes how he talks to God. And the clearer we are also will shape how we talk to God. That's genuine adoration. Isaiah's prayer 
And our prayers should be shaped by genuine adoration. Number two, it should be shaped by honest confession. By honest confession. You know, it's sobering reading this passage. You read all the things that God has done. All the ways that God has saved and redeemed. And then you get to verse 10. It says they rebelled. There's a but there. God is this. God has done this. God is love. God is merciful. But the people rebelled. God is faithful. But the people reject him. That despite God's faithful, steadfast love, they rebel against God. And the word for rebel there in Isaiah is strong. It means deliberately acting against God. It's a slap in the face of God. The result is that they now feel separated from God, like his face has been turned away from him. And that's the consequences of sin. God hasn't left them, but they no longer sense his presence. Verse 17 says it this way, Lord, do you make us stray? Why, Lord, do you make us stray from your ways? You harden our hearts so we don't fear you. Return because of your servants, the tribes of your heritage. Isaiah isn't trying to blame God here. He recognizes their guilt and their judgment. This is an honest and humble acceptance of where they are and how they got there. Remember that this, wasn't, this isn't the outside world. This is the remnant of God's people. And we too shouldn't forget that if we as the people of God turn from the truth of who God is, then we shouldn't be so arrogant to expect to still enjoy his presence and his grace in our lives. Hardening of our hearts is when our hearts are set on disobedience that we will become progressively more hardened toward God to the point that we don't sense his grace and his mercy anymore. Perhaps you've known someone like that. Perhaps you know someone like that. That it didn't matter what you said or what you did, their heart was just negatively fixed on you. In fact, anything you did would make it worse. Perhaps you've been that way to someone. There's someone in your life that no matter what they do, you can always find a fault in them. You can always find they do something great like, oh, they had a secret motivation. They were doing that for another reason. You never could find anything good about them. That reason, whatever it is, you just can't break through. You don't, you don't want to break through it. Isaiah sees the predicament of his own people and knows that the only thing, the only thing that can change their heart is God as they turn back to him. And in Isaiah's eyes, the need for such confession is for everyone. Look at verses 6 through 7 of 64. Isaiah says, all of us have become like something unclean. And all of our righteous acts are like polluted garments. All of us wither like a leaf. Our iniquities carry us away like the wind. No one calls on your name, striving to take hold of you. You have hidden your face from us and made us melt because of our iniquity. It's a disturbing image. Isaiah is saying that sin is at the heart of this, and we're powerless against it. Note, Isaiah is not just speaking of the people of Israel, but he's identifying himself with them. He's saying, I've done this. All of us have become like the one who is unclean. Or as Paul says in Romans, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And here's Isaiah saying that, that despite their enemies pressing in, despite them living in a foreign land in exile, despite them having been evicted from their homes and their possessions, Isaiah sees with great, great clarity that the biggest problem is not the enemy out there, it's the enemy in the enemy in here. When's the last time you checked your heart to see if the enemy is growing in there? When's the last time you've examined your heart to see, God, are there things of in my life, in my heart, that are not right here? There's a passage in Psalms, it's a gruesome passage. Um, the people who are in exile, and the psalmist writes as fast as he says, I would love to take their babies and smash them against the rocks. And I think it's Psalm 137. It's a gruesome, gruesome passage. And you can't even imagine 
it being in there. It's a, he has a point. He's saying, man, I would love to take my enemies while they're still babies and destroy them. Because I know that if they grow, they will overcome and destroy me. Your little sins that you do that you think will affect no one, if you are not careful, eventually that sin becomes a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, and one day you will fall. And it wasn't that you just fell. It was a gradual process of letting sin grow in your life. Isaiah is saying, confess, confess, confess. Keep going to Jesus about the sins in your life because you don't want it to grow and overtake you. You don't want to fall. You don't want to destroy your life. Guard your heart against that. Kill the sin while it's still small. Don't let it get big and destroy you. How can you be saved only through God's decisive action? And this is exactly how Isaiah prays. Isaiah reminds us that our prayers should be shaped by genuine adoration of who God is. It should be shaped by honest confession, saying, God, save me, help me. And finally, Isaiah tells us that our prayers should be shaped by a passionate plea. The passionate plea is a prayer for intervention to an unchanging God. Like the prayers of Abraham for the city of Sodom, and Moses' prayers in the wilderness and the prayers of Ezra and Daniel and the prayers of Jesus at the Last Supper and right at the heart of Isaiah's cry and concern is Isaiah 64, verse 5. It says, you welcome the one who joyfully does what is right. They remember you in your ways, but we have sinned and you are angry. How can we be saved if we remain in our sins? How much longer, God, will you be angry with us It's not angry or arrogant, but it's passionate and honest before God. They see the disparity between their own ways and what God has been asking of them. They see the contrast between what God has promised and their longing for it to come to pass. There is so much to discourage them. But Isaiah prays with amazing conviction in verse 1 of Isaiah 64, if only you would tear the heavens open and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence. Isaiah is praying that the heavens would be torn, that God would come down. He recognizes that they need not only saving from their enemies, but they also need saving from themselves. People can look to all sorts of things to make God feel present. People can even think that they can bring God's kingdom to completion themselves. But what we need is not an imitation What we need is for God to come down. My friends, that's exactly what God did. And that's exactly what God will do. He came down to earth from heaven, who is God and Lord over all. He put on flesh. He has known our distress. He has carried our sin. He has come close to us. He is Emmanuel, God with us. God has torn the heavens open once. And friends, the promise of Scripture is he will do it again. He'll do it again. Revelation 1 says it this way. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who have pierced him. And all the people on the earth will mourn because of him. It shall be. It shall be. The final verses of Isaiah 64 are bursting with a passionate plea for salvation, not just for himself, but for the people around him. It's all in the plural form. Look at verses 8 and 9. Yet, God, you are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are the work of your hands. Lord, don't be terribly angry. Remember our iniquity forever. Look, all of us are your people. Note that Isaiah identifies with the lost. Do not remember our sins forever. And he prays with this phenomenal passion. Oh, look on us, God, as we pray. Isaiah isn't being bossy here. He's not trying to approach God on his own merit. He's being a watchman. He's being an intercessor. And his confidence is firmly based on who God is. I wonder when we pray for our friends when we pray for our family, when we pray for our city, when we pray for our world, when we pray for our nation, do we share the passion 
for God and for saving like Isaiah does. I'm so grateful for those in our church that pray. I'm so grateful that when I come here on Sunday mornings, often the worship team doesn't just get up here and practice immediately. They will sit and they'll pray before service together as a team, just praying that God would move powerfully. I'm so grateful for those who gather in the other room at 10 o'clock and pray because the reason is that prayer is the engine room of our church. Prayer is what makes things happen. It doesn't matter how well we perform or what we do or how much we strategize. Without prayer, friends, we are lost. Without it, we are trying to do it on our own. And when we try to do it on our own, we will stumble and fail. But when we pray, we're crying, God, help. God, show up. God, tear open the heavens and come down and move and do what only you can do. Friends, without prayer, there is nothing you and I can do. I heard of a church recently as I was preparing for the sermon and read about a church that every week on the day of their services, people would gather in their building, moving from seat to feet, seat to seat, pleading with God that he would fill their people with hearts who are ready to receive gospel. Not that their church would be bigger, but that no one in their church would perish. May we be a church that prays. May we be a church that is dependent on Jesus. May we be families and men that lead our homes by saying we're going to pray together. May we be women who sit on our knees and pray for our children and our husbands and our family and our friends and our church. May we be men and women of prayer. May prayer drive us to dependence on Jesus. This week I was driving my parents' car back from Philly. My parents just moved here. My dad was the one that read the passage in Malayalam. If you know me, I love road trips. And a 23-hour road trip, um, something I enjoy for one simple reason, audiobooks. Audiobooks. I love audiobooks. And I can read an entire book in, like, one of those trips, right? And, like, I never have 10 hours to sit and read a book. And I can finish the whole book in one trip. And... For some reason, Monday morning as we were driving, God kept bringing back a book to me that I read years ago in college, a book that transformed my life on prayer. It was a book written by a man named Jim Simula, who's a pastor of Brooklyn Tabernacle in New York. It's called Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. If you haven't read this book, I would highly, highly encourage it to you. It is mostly the story about what God has done through the power of prayer in a church in Brooklyn. A church that when he started had maybe $13 in the bank account. I can't remember. It had barely nothing. Couldn't even pay the pastor. And now they have Grammy-winning award um, music, and God is just doing powerful stuff to him. But he said the way their church grew was he got convicted him one day simply to invite the church to pray on Tuesday. And he said, we're not going to do anything else but simply to pray. And they started gathering, and they started praying. And they started praying. And they started praying week in. And week out, and all of a sudden, God started to deliver drug dealers. God started bringing prostitutes to their church, and they were being saved. God started restoring marriages. God started healing the sick. God just started doing some incredible, powerful things. That The only thing you could say, this is a God thing. Right? This wasn't them doing it. This was a God thing. And it was through people that were praying. And I'm not saying that we need to imitate it because it worked in New York, but I'm saying we need to be a church that is absolutely dependent on Jesus. We don't need to copy someone else, but we need to be people that say, God, if you don't show up, if you don't come, if you don't tear open the heavens, all we're doing is just a program week in and week out. But God, if you show up in this room, man, there could be broken hearts in here and be restored in a heartbeat. God, if you show up in this room and you just want to do what you want to do. There could be hearts that are hardened that you can soften them and they can become followers of Jesus. God, if you show up in this room, sick can be healed. Miracles can happen. Not because we did it, but God, you showed up. Church, may we be people that pray. Jim Simba, in one of the chapters, he made this comment. He said, the devil isn't terribly frightened by our human efforts, or by our credentials. 
He doesn't care about them. But he knows his kingdom will be damaged when the people of God begin to lift up their hearts to God. He knows the kingdom will make an impact when the people of God will lift up their hearts to God. Not when we have a great strategy. Not when worship flows perfectly. Not when Pastor Sam actually finishes the sermon on time. But when the people lift their hearts to God. May we be people of prayer. I can't tell you how much I desire that our church would be known as a church that simply prays. Even more than the beautiful diversity that God has brought us, I want us to be known as people that when there's a need, the first thing we do is not figure out the answer to that. The first thing we do is let's stop, let's pray, let's talk to Jesus. That we would be people that would be marked and characterized that more than anything else, we trust and depend on Jesus. May we be people of prayer, adoring Jesus for who he is, confessing the shortcomings of who we are, pleading that people may know God's saving grace. That's how we should pray. That's how God calls us to pray. In a moment, we're about to enter communion. I believe we're about to read one more passage of Scripture in Spanish. I want you to just close your eyes and meditate on the passage. And then the worship team will sing and we'll take communion together. At the cross, when Jesus died, Scripture says that the veil in the temple that separated the Holy of Holies from the normal, from the holy place, was torn from top to the bottom. The Holy of Holies was a place that only the high priest could go, and even that they could only go once a year. But when the, tail was, when the veil was torn, it gave access to you and I to go to God anytime we want, anywhere we want. And so we talk about prayer today as we come to communion. I want you to recognize that the only reason we can even have this conversation is because of what the table symbolizes. That because Jesus died, because Jesus took the penalty of our sin, we can now anytime go and say, God, Abba, Father. So as we come to the table this morning, know that the only reason we can pray is because of Jesus. So I'm going to invite you to examine your heart, examine your attitudes, your affections, your desires, your motives. Would you adore Jesus for who he is and what he's done? As the Holy Spirit brings things to mind that you need to confess of, would you confess? And then would you come to the table this morning knowing he has forgiven you, he has accepted you, that you are his son, his daughter. Would you take some time as we hear the scripture passage, as we sing this song, whenever you're ready, I'm going to invite you to just come down the center aisle, grab the elements, and you can go back to your seats and take, um, partake of communion in your seats. Let's worship Jesus together. Father, thank you that we have access to you anytime, anywhere. Thank you that you, not only do you hear us, but you're a God who moves on our behalf. Father, as a church, as we come to the end of this year, we put our trust and our dependence on you. There's not a single thing we can do next year that will make any difference if you're not in it. And so, God, we put our trust, our dependence on you. For the families of this church, 
we pray, Father, that you, your Holy Spirit, would guard, would protect them. For students, protect them from evil. For our children, protect them from harm and danger. Father, there is not anything we can do to guard over any of these things, but we trust in the one who can. We put our confidence in the one who can. May we be people of prayer. May we be people who are dependent on you. May we be people who say more of you and less of me. God, be glorified through and through our lives today. We love you in Jesus' name.